We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and the culture of the peoples with whom the Upper Canada Treaties were signed and our responsibility as treaty members. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg peoples. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. As we light our Christ candle this morning, we open our hearts and our lives to the light of Christ. And we commit ourselves to taking that light with us and sharing it with everyone we meet. Come and sing the praise of our wondrous God. Awesome and marvelous are God's works. Come and celebrate God who refreshes us and brings us new life. Be joyful and celebrate the goodness of God here and everywhere. Awesome and marvelous are God's works. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. Life has begun again, O Lord. You have given us another day of grace, another day to live, to speak to someone, to touch someone, to ask something, to give something. Whatever we make up this day, whatever we become this day, we place it in your hands. Amen. Let us pray. I admit to you, O God, that I am often distressed by the daily news, by the failure of nations to agree, by the persistent problems of hunger and war and economy, by crime, negligence, and immorality. I wish my sense of the presence of Christ were strong and I had more confidence in his eternal victory over the world. 
Then I would not be shaken by the winds of adversity, but would stand like a tree planted by the living waters. Forgive my weakness and deepen my faith. Through Jesus, our friend and savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, this is a true word and worthy of acceptance. He has borne our shortcoming and by his stripes we are healed. He has held captivity captive and won our devotion forever. Christ's name be praised forever and ever. Amen. We are all part of the body of Christ, members one of another. Let us acknowledge our dependency on each other as we greet one another in Christian love. Peace of Christ be with you all. Welcome to the Reading for All Ages today, October the 24th. The theme for today's service is Second Chances, or as Roy's sermon title is, Rapachage. Today's book, Jeremiah Learns to Read, is in many ways the ultimate Rapachage book. It's written by Joellen Bogart, with Laura Fernandez and Rick Jacobson. So let's listen to this book, Jeremiah Learns to Read. Jeremiah knew how to build a split rail fence, and he knew how to cook buttermilk pancakes, but he didn't know how to read. Jeremiah knew how to make a table out of a tree or sweet syrup from its sap, but he didn't know how to read. Jeremiah knew how to grow beautiful tomatoes, long green cucumbers, and juicy cobs of corn, but he didn't know how to read. He knew the tracks of the animals and the signs of the seasons, but he didn't know the letters and the words. I want to learn to read, he said to his brother Jackson. You're an old man, Jeremiah, said Jackson. You have children and grandchildren, and you can do almost anything. But I can't read, said Jeremiah. Fine, said his brother. Then learn. I want to learn to read, Jeremiah said to his wife, Juliana. You're wonderful just the way you are, said Juliana, and she stroked his gray beard. But I can be even better, he said. Fine, said his wife. Learn, then you can read to me. She smiled at him over her knitting. I want to learn to read, Jeremiah said to his old sheepdog. The old sheepdog just looked at him, then lay down on the rug, on the rag rug by Jeremiah's feet. Jeremiah thought, how could I learn to read? My brother can't teach me, my wife can't teach me, this old dog can't teach me. How will I learn? Jeremiah thought and thought, and then he smiled. The next morning, Jeremiah got up at sunrise and did his chores. Then he washed his face and his hands, brushed his hair and his beard, and put on his favorite shirt. He made biscuits and gravy and sliced tomatoes for breakfast and packed a sandwich for his lunch. Then he kissed Juliana goodbye and walked out the door. He joined a group of children walking down the tree-shaded lane. When they went into the schoolhouse, Jeremiah went in too. Mrs. Trumbull smiled when she saw him. I want to learn to read, he told her. She poured it pointed toward an empty seat and Jeremiah sat down. Class, said Mrs. Trumbull, we have a new student today. Jeremiah started learning the letters and the sounds they made. Some of the children helped him. At recess, he sat under a tree and told stories. 
He showed Sarah and David how to chirp like a chickadee and honk like a goose. Soon, Jeremiah was learning words. He studied his lessons carefully. He practiced his writing every day. Jeremiah loved it when the teacher and the older children read to the class. Sometimes he drew pictures while he listened. Jeremiah was learning, but he was teaching too. He showed the Miller twins how to whittle with a pocket knife. He taught Mrs. Tremble how to make applesauce and how to whistle through her teeth. After a while, Jeremiah was putting words together and writing his own stories. He wrote about saving a baby squirrel. He wrote about swimming in the river. He wrote about the day he met his wife. Juliana watched Jacob practicing his writing on the table after supper. When are you going to read to me, she asked. When the time is right, he answered. One day, Jeremiah took a book of poems home from school. The poems were about trees and clouds and streams and swiftly running deer. Jeremiah hid it under his pillow. That night when he and Juliana went to bed, he pulled out the book. Listen, he said. He read a poem about the soft petals and sweet smell of roses. He read a poem about the crashing waves at the seashore. He read a poem about love. Juliana looked into her husband's gray eyes. Oh, Jeremiah, she said, I want to learn to read. Jeremiah smiled at Juliana. First thing after breakfast, my love. And Jeremiah turned off the light. Alfred Lord Tennyson called the Book of Job the greatest piece of poetry of ancient and modern times, which is to say, no longer a work one merely reads as a guide to wisdom or salvation, but one to be taught in classes as literature of the highest order. The most disturbing challenge in this work is that its main protagonist never alludes to Satan vis-a-vis -vis his calamities by any of his names as if he were not merely unwilling to give the devil his due, but could not even conceive of his existence. When a multitude of disgraces befall him, neither does Job attribute them to the realm of natural catastrophes or human enemies whom the narratives tell us are the proximate cause. For him, God is the sole author of all that befalls humankind, good and bad. Point of our lesson here this morning, we pass from the mystery of evil to the even greater mystery of restoration, which I must confess I myself have, have just barely begun to understand. So let's listen to this transition piece from the Hebrew scriptures, Job 42, 1 to 6, a really important movement for Job in this book. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you when you declare to me. I had heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Jesus laid some pretty heavy demands to discipleship. In the Markham community, there were three major concerns he hoped his people would deal with. One was ambition, the second was envy and intolerance, and the third, scandalizing and belittling others, what amounted to bullying. Here then, our gospel lesson from Mark chapter 9, verse 38 through 50. 
John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us, therefore, is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose their reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it'd be better for you if a great millstone were hung round your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fires. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell itself. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worms never die and the fires are never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Our reading from the book of Job brings us to an exciting climax with the words, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes truly see you. The religion of hearsay has become for Job the religion of conscious experience. Knowledge about God has become the life-transforming experience of personally knowing God. Job has suffered incredible tragedy, and his why rises to the pitch of a scream of anguish. He is sure that under a just God that the good will prosper and the evil will suffer. Conversely, if people prosper, they are being blessed by God. And if they suffer, there must have been sin committed, extraordinary sin committed. For some, this would mean sharing the bizarre, if not perverse notion that those stricken with, for example, the AIDS virus, are responsible for their own demise, for they must have done something terrible in the eyes of God. But Job's own experience contradicts such perverse theology. He was a man of integrity, yet a victim of disaster. So questions throng and answers tarry. Religion by hearsay, not enough. Only when we meet God in living experience can our souls find peace. The book of Job wrestles with the question of the mind. Its magnificent poetry expresses questions that we all raise. Why do good people suffer? The turmoil of his spirit makes us feel close to Job. We often hear others speak of the patience of Job, and yet he was not a patient man, except in the sense that he suffered and saw his way through that suffering. But he did not suffer without screaming or rebelling. He did not suffer without railing against injustices that he felt he had been handed. His academic knowledge broke down under the extreme blows of successive personal disaster. His religion by hearsay was good, but not good enough. It was time for a repechage. A repechage. Repechage a trial heat, as in rowing or judo, in which first round losers are given a second chance to qualify for the semifinals in their event. It was no different with Job. His personal experience of God revealed the inadequacy of the religion of hearsay and his real need to know God, not just to know about God, but actually to know God experientially. It is no different in our gospel either. We witness a dark, stark contrast in the spirit of John and the spirit of Jesus. John has a sectarian view of the gospel. He
He feels that Jesus has a monopoly on casting out all demons. He was jealous of Jesus to a degree. In contrast, Jesus feels, feels very differently. He orders John not to forbid the man's good works. Jesus is not afraid of competition. He's not involved in competition. In fact, he doesn't see the man's exorcism as competition at all. He sees his ministry as attempting to do as much for God as he possibly can. Doesn't care who helps along the way, who gets credit along the way. It's irrelevant. What's important is, if you're not against him, then you must be for him. Behavior in the name of Christ is clearly a signal that our gospel material is addressed to a post-Easter church. Emphasis, post-Easter church, and not the disciples of Jesus' time. During his ministry, Jesus himself did not teach his followers to wear or use his name. In fact, Jesus himself did not accept the name Messiah, Christ, or Holy One. Anytime you hear one of these phrases relegated to his given name, you have a pretty good clue that you are reading or hearing a post-resurrection story narrative. Not being one of us is not an adequate criterion for determining that a person is not a Christian. Granted, standards for discerning who was and wasn't a disciple was a very serious problem for the early Christian church, especially in the case of itinerant prophets and healers. And what were those standards? Ethical conduct, says Matthew. Doctrinal confession, says John. Confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior, says St. Paul. And faith in action, of course, says St. James. But not being in our circle, at least in Mark's church, was no ground for exclusivism. And the other thing this gospel is pointing to is that anyone, anyone has the right to use Jesus' name and do good. Coca-Cola may have a copyright on its name. Nike has a copyright on its name. But the church does not have a copyright on being Christian. There are some fascinating paradoxes in our world. More people are now studying English in China than all the combined English-speaking people in North America. It's astounding to think about. They are studying English because it teeters on becoming the universal language both of the scientific field and business communities globally. The French-speaking pilot of a state-of-the-art Airbus built in, in France, flying in French airspace, and on final approach to Charles Gaulle International Airport, must use English to speak to the air traffic controller. And yet with English on the brink of becoming the language of Babel, there are more places in Great Britain where English is not spoken. Some native-born Scots in the Hebrides, for example, still speak predominantly Gaelic. Christians present some interesting paradoxes to our world as well. Some outside our church family honor personal morality, diplomacy, and kindness more than some inside it. Jesus has little concern for how or where or by whom the good news was spread. He did have a great deal of concern that it be spread now. Hospitality was to be practiced freely and with little requirement. Even a cup of cold water, given, received, was not unnoticed or unrewarded. One of the things I discovered early on in my stint with Pine Grove United Church in Thunder Bay was that they built right into the fabric of their yearly budget a policy in funerals for the indigent, for those who couldn't for street people, homeless people, we would agree to take on a certain segment and to pave their way for a beautiful send-off of a loved one. And there were other churches that followed. And then there was the local pharmacist in our town in Goddard. We'll call him Mark. Mark was a, an amazing character. One day I was going in to fill a prescription. And wouldn't you know, he was on the phone and he gave me the, just a minute, 
the, the sign. And um, when I got off the phone, I said, that sounded an awful lot like, like pastoral care. He said, well, I guess it could be. Every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon from 2 to 3.30, I connect with a half dozen people each of those days, predominantly elderly, widowed women, lonely, perhaps not reading their bottles quite right. You check in with them and let them know there was a person out there, there were people out there who really care. So why is it that people of all ilk feel a need to tear down others in order to raise their own profile? Jesus is emphatic that anyone, anyone with a fledgling faith or anyone who is undergoing major crises should be afforded special care and consideration. Causing one of them to stumble is a grave, grave sin indeed. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they were friends. They may have meant well, but they ended up being stumbling blocks for Job. And they were being watched carefully from heaven above. My mom's friend, Erica, was a top flight competitive skater who as a result of taunting and bullying, developed anorexia, and her skating prowess flandered, and who knows, a future career was dashed. And Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for them to be cast into the sea with a millstone about their neck. It is evident that Christians will have to learn to live collectively with tension and disparity in interpretation and in understanding the world around them. Tension and chaos are the engines that drive change. Take Eric Lamaz, for example. Canada's premier equestrian rider was some years ago banned from two Olympic Games for reasons of substance abuse and, in the words of COA, quote, a lack of proper decorum and esprit de corps fitting a Canadian Olympian. But thanks be to the support of veterans like Captain Eric uh, Ian Miller, Eric Lamaze won his appeal, was given another chance, a repechage, a chance to exhibit his true God-given gifts, a chance at redemption. And following his gold medal ride aboard Hickstead, Eric said, there is nothing more important in the realm of human history than one who has persisted through pain and self-contempt to a place of self-actualization. Job's terrible tragedies broke the surface tension of his prosperous and successful life, but he discovered the true meaning of life when he met God and experienced the life-giving grace of the Spirit, whose wonderful giftedness and goodness, love and power, transcends human thought. When we experience suffering in our lives, it will leave us scarred, but not unchanged. In faith, we can choose how we will respond. And we learn from Jesus' teaching to see God's love and goodness in others. And we learn from Job to look to God in faith and in trust. When we see God with the eyes of faith, our lives are transformed by God's glory. That is Job's supreme, Job's supreme moment, when God is present with power and peace. And we can join along with him in saying, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye truly sees you. The word connotes a second chance and a vote of unconditional love and unbridled support along the way. It is the word of the Lord. And the word again is repishaj. Let us pray. O oh God of love, you know our frailties and you know our failings. You know our outrageousness and jealous criticisms of others the moment they take flight. Come this day and grant us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of forgiveness and love. In the name of our wandering guide in Christ we pray. Amen.
images of God's love for the world. This is our work of faith and our labor of love and our steadfastness of hope in Jesus Christ. Like the earliest Christians, we are here in this place because of the commitment, faith, and generosity of others who shared the good news of the gospel in their time. So we turn now, in our time, and share our faith and commitment through generous giving to support the ongoing ministry of this church in Christ's name. We honor your gifts at this time. Let us pray. Eternal God, you teach us not only to pray for ourselves, but to have concern for others and give thanks for all life. Bless these gifts, we pray, and guide us in their faithful use. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. In the stillness, O God, hear the sounds of our many voices. Some are lonely and they cry out for companionship. Some are hurt and ask for healing. Some are confused and seek direction. Some are compassionate and raise petitions for others. Some are merely glad to be here and speak their joy. Some don't know why they have come or what to say to you at a time like this. Gather us all up with our many voices into a sense of your holy presence. Transfigure us into the body of Christ, the living, breathing organism that all the world should see. Get the health, or let the health rather, of those who are healthy flow into the lives of those who are not. Let the spirit of love and caring come upon us, transforming us from limited, self-centered individuals into channels of your blessing and energy in the world. And take control of our hearts and minds as well. Bend us from thoughts of striving and gaining to attitudes of sharing and giving. Make us sensitive to one another's needs and feelings. Help us to embrace the world of the poor and neglected and those in mourning, even becoming like them in order to serve them best. Create a new atmosphere among us for living in the image of your Son, that we may be thankful and responsive creatures. And as we turn from stillness to pray, may the stillness remain inside us and go with us always. In the name of the giver of peace, who taught us to live out the kingdom prayer, he taught all his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank mm -hmm.
now go forth. May a purity of spirit and a devotion to Christ ignite your desire to build a world more humane, more holy. And may a regard for the dignity of all and a passion for enacting the love of God sustain and support your efforts to go out into the world to serve. Amen.